Welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and yes, I have a whiteboard, and I will use it to preach. Amen? So I'll be preaching to you today a message that I hope is an encouragement to you. And the title of the message is this, Jesus must be coming soon. Amen? There's just so many things pointing to the fact that he's got to come back at a certain time. And boy, it looks like we're close to that time. So I'm excited about it, and I know a lot of other Christians are as well. So turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 10. And I went ahead and wrote it all up here today because there's just so much to get out there. Amen. Some of this you might have seen, like one of these in, the, in one of my videos, another one in a different video, but I'm kind of just like taking it all and putting it all together today. So we do have a lot to get into. I'd like to go as quickly as I can through this. Try to make it short so you can share it with other people. I know a lot of folks like to share my videos, and I hope you'll share this one, because everything is pointing to Jesus Christ coming soon. Amen? And He must be coming soon with all that's taking place in this world. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you get that in your hand, we'll read that here in a second. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. But let me just say this. Thank God for YouTube. You know, um, On YouTube are a lot of other people who are Christians who are looking for the rapture. And I see videos from time to time where someone says, hey, look what I found in the Bible. And somebody else says, hey, look what I found in the Bible. It's almost like it's this huge puzzle, and this guy has a puzzle piece, and that guy has a puzzle piece, and this guy. And it's encouraging to get the whole puzzle and put it all together. So that's what we're going to try to do today. I'm going to show you all the puzzles, try to put it together. And the only conclusion that I can come to is Jesus must be coming soon if you believe the Bible. Now, let's go to 2 Thessalonians and uh, verse 1 and 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now when is he coming? He's coming at the rapture. And by our gathering together unto him. Rapture. Gathering together unto him. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So the rapture is very, very close. Don't be shaken. I get phone calls sometimes from people saying, Brother Breaker, I'm just oh, I'm shook up. I, it hasn't come yet. And I'm, I'm depressed and I'm discouraged. When is he coming? Well, all I can say is he must be coming soon. Because what we're going to look at today points to, wow, I don't see how it can be much longer. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. And Hebrews 10, 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And that's what I'm hoping to do today, is to exhort you and to encourage you. Exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. So much the more. As we see the day getting closer and closer, we should so much the more encourage one another. And I'm just excited to see people doing that. So the first thing I want to do today is I want to go to the Scriptures. Does the Bible tell us when the rapture is? Well, there's two camps out there. There's one camp that says, yeah, yeah, it's in there somewhere. And then there's the other camp that says, no, no, no one can read the Bible and find out the exact day of the rapture. That's impossible. <laughs> and I go, well, let's look at the Bible itself and, and let's see if we can answer that question. Is the date of the rapture in the Bible? Now, I don't claim to have found it, but as I read my Bible, I keep thinking, man, we must be getting closer and closer. And the Bible even says right here, as we see the day approaching, well, we see the day is coming soon, and the sooner we get to it, I think the more God will reveal. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is the rapture. Let's go there first. You know, I still get emails from people who say, Brother Breaker, there's no rapture. <laughs> and comments sometimes, they'll leave in the comment section, there's no such thing as a rapture. And yet, I read in the Bible all about it. So... Are they reading their Bibles? I, I wonder. But yes, there is a rapture. The rapture is in the Bible. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18, we read about the rapture. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now this is their body sleeping in the grave. Their soul has gone to heaven, those that are saved. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. He'll bring their soul down to their body, resurrect their body, put their soul back in it, and then take them up in a glorified body with body and soul together. Verse 5, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So we who are saved and haven't died yet, when the rapture comes, we'll go up with them. We'll be raptured out of here. Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Being caught up, that's the rapture. 
caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The Bible talks about the rapture being caught up, and it says it's a comfort. So who are you to come along and say, no, there's no rapture? Are you trying to steal my comfort? Yeah, I think you are. You need to be careful. It's a comfort for me to know that Jesus Christ is coming back to get me out of this mess. And boy, is it a mess today. So when is it coming? What's the date of the rapture? Well, I don't know, but I do know my Bible. And I do know that in the Bible it makes it look like the sooner we get closer to it, the more we just might know what day. Now, when I say that, a lot of people say, no, Mr. Breaker, Matthew 24, 36, look at what Jesus said. Okay, let's look at it. Let's look at what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, and you know what? We'll look at what you said if you'll look at what I say after, okay? I'll look at your verse if you'll look at my verse, okay? Let's, let's, let's play the verse game. You give me this verse, now let me give you this verse, okay? Because in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And so they say, so in the Bible, the Bible says, Jesus himself says, you can't know the day or the hour. Um, hold on a second. He said that in his earthly ministry almost 2,000 years ago. Do you know there was more Bible after what was written here? And God revealed some things after that? So it says, no man knows the day or hour but the Father in heaven. Okay, now let's go to the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it's called, the last book of the Bible. And look at what it says, the very first verse. The very first verse. Look what it says. The revelation of Jesus Christ, you know, who just said that, that no man knew the day or hour in his day except the Father in heaven. Well, he said that while on earth. Now he rose again. Now he's in heaven. And look what it says. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, that would be God the Father, gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant. <laughs> So there you go. You have a revelation from the Father to Jesus after, while Jesus is in heaven, and it's called the book of Revelation. It's revealing to us what the Father revealed to the Son. And look what it says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 3. Revelation 3, 3, it says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Jesus says to a church, watch for when I'm coming, because if you don't watch, you won't know the what. He says you won't know the hour. <laughs> I find that interesting. So he says you won't know the hour. So what's the opposite of that? If you are watching, then you just might know the hour. Hmm. So does the Bible teach no man know the day or hour? Well, that's what Jesus said way back then. But if you read the book of Revelation, you find out that there's some more revelation given. And that the Father revealed some things to Jesus, and these are the words of Jesus. And Jesus says, now if you're not watching, you won't know. What's the opposite of that? So if you are watching, you will know. Hmm. I find that quite interesting. You know, in the Old Testament, there's a rapture of sorts. Um, if you get a chance, go to my video on YouTube entitled The, the Seven Raptures. Because there are literally seven raptures in the Bible. But one of these was the time that Elijah was taken up. And Elijah was taken up by God in what we would say is, is a type of our rapture. It's a type of the rapture, but it's a literal rapture because he was taken out of this world. And look at this in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. You see, he was a prophet, and he had, I guess you could call it, a school of prophets. And a lot of these people that learned from him, they were prophets also. And look at what it says here. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. So Elijah had Elisha as his protege, I guess we could call him. And so he was learning from Elisha. And so they go together. He was his Padawan for, for the modern vernacular. <laughs> and they went together. And look at this, verse 2. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Now verse 3, And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yeah, I know it. Hold ye your peace. 
And it says it another time there, I believe. But look at that. Here was the rapture for Elijah. And the prophets came to Elisha and said, Hey, today's the day that he's getting raptured. Did you know that? He goes, Yeah, I know. <laughs> what an interesting thing that in the Old Testament they knew the very day of when a rapture was going to take place. Is it possible in the New Testament to know that? Well, I'm not saying I do. I'm not saying I don't. But if you go to the scriptures, what does it say in 2 Peter 3.8? Well, let's go ahead and read that. 2 Peter chapter 3.8. By looking at the scriptures, I can come to no other conclusion than it's very close to the time of when the rapture should be. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. Peter says, hey, don't be ignorant. Okay? Well, how do you not be ignorant? You study. Paul says, study to show thyself approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2.15. So Peter says here, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So in the eyes of God, a thousand years is like one whole day. Because God's outside of time. He's eternal. He's in eternity. So he's looking in on time. And to him, it's you know goes by real fast. A thousand years seems like a day to him. But there's a little more to that. Do you know that in the Bible, the Bible says that God created everything in six days, and on the seventh day, God rested? So you have the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day, the seventh day. And if you take those seven days of literal creation, and you look at the history of the world, you find out that the world is only about 7,000 years old. Actually, 6,000. If you get a chance, go to my video on YouTube entitled The, the 7,000 Years of Human History. Blow your mind. So according to that, if a day is, is a thousand years, a thousand years one day, and you line that up with the 7,000 years of human history, where are we now? We're about right here. And the Bible talks about the millennial kingdom and how Jesus has to rule for the final 7,000 years. So we're really close to what's called the tribulation period. The seven-year tribulation. And before that is the rapture. So just looking at God's historical timeline, it looks like we must be close to the rapture. Jesus must be coming soon, just because the scriptures lay out 7,000 years of human history, and that's all. Do you believe that? Now let's go over to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And Paul says something here that's quite interesting. I wonder if the early church didn't know more than what we know. <laughs> We look at the seasons. See, first we look at the scriptures, and the scriptures say in Revelation 3.3, 3, if you're not watching, you won't know the day or the hour, but if you are watching, maybe you will know the day. As you see the day approaching, I mean, we're looking for the day of the rapture, and I'm looking in the scriptures for it. But I'm also looking at the seasons. I'm also looking at where we are in history. And we're very close to what appears to be the coming of the Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast system. Well, the church has got a Get out of that. Be, be out of here before that. And it says here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, he's talking to save people about the rapture. And he says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you. You, as a thief. <laughs> what a thing to say. Hey, Christian, you know, you're not going to be surprised when the rapture comes because you'll have an idea of when it's coming because you'll know the season. Do you think we're in the season? I, I think so. I think so. And let's continue reading there. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So watch for the rapture. Now, are we in the season? I think so. There are some amazing things. In 1948, way over here, Israel became a nation again. And then in 2018, something spectacular took place. There's a president of the United States of America, DJT. We'll just give you his initials, you know, Donald J. and then his last name. He declared that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, exactly 70 years later. And you look at 70 in the Bible and you go, wow, there's a lot of 70s in the Bible. I, 
I really don't have time to go through all these verses, but if you love studying the Bible, look these up sometime. Jeremiah 25, 11 and 12. They were in Babylon in captivity for 70 years. Jeremiah 29, 10. God said, I will visit you. Um, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 2 was a prophecy. 70 years of the desolation of Jerusalem. Now go to Isaiah 23, 15. There's so many places in the Bible where God does 70. And a lot of times it's a judgment to Israel, 70 years. Isaiah chapter 23 and verse 15. Isaiah 23, 15, look at this. I find this interesting. Isaiah chapter 23, verse 15 says, And it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten 70 years. Okay, now watch what he says next. According to the days of one king, after the end of 70 years shall Tyre sing as a harlot. So 70 years, it says, is as the rule or as the days of a king. It almost sounds like he's saying 70 years is a generation. That's important for what we'll see here in a minute. Let's go to Psalms chapter 90. Psalms chapter 90. In the Bible, we have God telling us 70 this, 70 that, 7 this, 7 that. God is a God of numbers. Matter of fact, there's a book in the Bible called the Book of Numbers. And God uses that number 7 and the number 70 a lot. And so we look at that as Christians and we think, wow, that's Old Testament. And now a lot of times it's talking to Jews. What about New Testament? Well, we believe, who are true Bible believers, that God is not done with Israel. He's going back to dealing with them. So we make a big deal out of this 70-year thing from 1948 to 2018. And then we say, but, but how come the rapture hasn't come yet? Well, Psalms chapter 90 and look at verse 10. The days of our years are three score years and ten. Now score is 20. So three times 20 is 60. So 60 and 10 is 70. So the days of our years are 70. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So between 70 and four score, four times 20 is 80. Between 70 and 80 years, God is saying this is what appears to be a generation, as in the days of a king. So a generation is between 70 to 80 years in the Bible. Now why is this important? Well, let's go back to Matthew chapter 24. Jesus is speaking to Israel about the end times. And when Israel gets back into their nation, after being cast out because they rejected their Messiah... And it makes it sound like God says, you're just going to have one generation in the land, and then I'll come back and rule over you. So we look at Israel being born as a nation as a really big thing in 1948. And we're looking at that, and then we add 70 to 80 to it. We say, where does that come up to? Well, you add 70, it's 2028. If you add 80, what do you get? If you add 80, you get 2028. So between 2018 and 2028... Somewhere in there has got to be a seven-year tribulation. And that's how we that are Christians are trying to put all the puzzle pieces together to try to figure it out. And in Matthew 24, 32, Jesus says this. Matthew 24, 32. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. What is? Well... When God comes back to dealing with Israel and when he eventually comes back and rules for a thousand years in the Millennial Kingdom at the Battle of Armageddon. But also, what's before that? The rapture. And then he says here in verse 34, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So a generation appears to be between 70 and 80 years old. And that generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. So we're looking at all this, and we're trying to fit the rapture in, and we say, where does the rapture have to come? Well, from 2028, subtract 7 for 7-year tribulation, you get 2021. And a lot of Christians are like, yeah, 2021's got to be the rapture. Well, I hope it is. Uh, but is it? Could it be later? I, there's a lot of questions. And here we are in 2021, and we're getting to the end of it, and we're like, well, you know, no time like the present, Lord. You must be coming soon. Any time now. <laughs> Some Christians I talk to say, it's too late, he should have come already. Well, all I know is he said he's coming, and he's not a liar, so he's coming soon. 
So I see the seasons, and all the seasons are pointing to, wow, we're in that season of when Jesus should be returning soon at the rapture. So I look at that and the, and the fig tree generation, and I say, man, we've we got to be close. Okay? But then I also look at signs. Now, are signs for us today who are Christians? Not really. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.22 says that signs are for the Jews. The Jews seek after a sign. So signs are more for Israel. Okay? God's not done with Israel. All these Old Testament prophecies, all these Old Testament promises to them, He's not done with them. So as you go through and you begin to look at signs in the heavens, you go, wow. I mean, you can't help but scratch your head and go, all right, th this must be intelligent design. This must be a creator in heaven doing all this because this cannot be a coincidence. You say, what are you talking about? Well, let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14. God is speaking to Israel through the signs of the heavens, through the positioning of the planets and, and other things. God uses that like a clock, all the things that are in heaven. And in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14, the first chapter in the entire Bible, God tells us that that's what he made it for. Okay, Genesis 1.14, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So God said he created the lights in the firmament of the heaven. He created the stars and the planets up there like a timepiece, like a clock. And it is for times, and it is for seasons, well, and it is for days, and it is for years. Okay? I want you to see that. That's what the Bible says. So God says, that's what he did. And if you see that, and you look up at that, you go, wow, man, God is, is real. <laughs> because uh, it all seems to be mathematically perfect. It can't be just a coincidence. It can't be just a random explosion of nothing, the Big Bang. And then all these things just happen to be up there in the heaven in such a way that on certain feasts of Israel, they show up. All these signs. That can't be a coincidence. That must be an intelligent designer. Go to Job chapter 35 and verse 5. Job 35, 5, look what it says. Look unto the heavens and see, and behold the clouds which are higher than thou. Look unto the heavens and see. You look up in the heavens, you see a whole bunch of stars up there. And you see some interesting things. Look at Isaiah 51. Isaiah chapter 51, and you see what are called constellations, and all the constellations have names, and they all move. And you know, a lot of people in the old days would look at that, and they would try to figure out, hmm, is God giving any signs? Is, is God going to show us something? And they looked at the heavens and the way that they worked as they were God giving them signs. Now, a lot of people say, and that's evil, stay away from that, that's astrology, okay? Well, there is astrology, and there is astronomy, okay? I'm not against astronomy. Astronomy is just looking at them, knowing what they are, and understanding them. Astrology is trying to use that to tell the future for yourself. But do you know what? God made it, and God put those up there for signs, Genesis 1.14. And when Jesus Christ shows up, the Bible says there was a star in heaven marking the birth. So God can use those as signs for who? For the Jews. And so I don't know. I've, I've looked into a lot of these old Jewish synagogues, okay? And in all these old Jewish synagogues, they always have a, a picture of the constellations. They were always looking at the heavens. And many of them, they were looking for eclipses and blood moons and things like that. And were looking at the constellations. And they were saying, these are signs from God. And they would try to figure out what was going to take place based upon those signs. Were they right all the time? Probably not. But uh, God did put that sign of the star in heaven called the Star of Bethlehem when Jesus was born. So God is marking some times and seasons. So God is behind this. All right, You can twist it. You can always twist it. Every uh, bad thing in this world is a good thing twisted, an old pastor said one time. You can twist that thing and turn it into astrology, but you shouldn't. But it is there and it is a real thing that God is marking his time of seasons with these stars. Now, let's look at Isaiah 51, 6. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look into the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. So lift up your eyes to the heavens. God is saying it's not wrong to look up at the heavens. Now, there are other verses in which God says, but you're not supposed to worship the heavens. 
All right, you only worship the true God, not the other ones. You know, there are what's called fallen angels and things like that. So there's only one true God, and he declares himself. The heavens declare his handiwork. Now go to Daniel chapter 6 and verse 27. Daniel 6, 27 says this. He delivereth and rescueth. Who is he? God, the God of Daniel, the true God. He delivereth and rescueth. He worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So the true God delivers signs in the heavens. Again, who are the signs for? Well, the signs are for the Jews. Let's go to Luke chapter 21. So, huh. So God can do signs in heaven. And he can mark events that are to happen on this earth by celestial signs in heaven. That's just Bible. And I'm surprised people would, would speak against that. I've talked about something like this before. And people say, oh, breakers into astrology. I'm like, no, no, I don't believe in astrology. I don't believe in the horoscope. But I do believe in a God who is so powerful and so all-knowing that when he put up everything up in the heavens, he knew what would happen on earth thousands of years before it did, and he put corresponding signs in heaven so the people on earth would go, oh, wow, this just happened. Oh, well, God already knew it was going to happen. So God is showing us how intelligent he is and how he can know the future. That's just amazing to me. So here we are in Luke, and look at what it says here in Luke 21, 11. Luke 21, 11. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilence, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Great signs shall there be from heaven. Again, who are the signs for? The Jews. I didn't get a chance to read Job 38, verse 31 through 33, but it talks about the Maseroth, and it mentions constellations, and it talks about the ordinances of heaven. Now let's look at Acts chapter 2. All right, I'm trying to get this all together for you to show you that, yes, God put the stars and the planets in their cycles, in their rotations, and he did it in such a way that he knew exactly what was going to take place on this earth for 7,000 years, and he knew how to do it in such a way to line things up in heaven so that when that happened, there was something up there that a person looks up and goes, that just happened to happen at the same time we did that, you know? That couldn't have been an accident. That had to have been God saying, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. So that's amazing. Now, Acts chapter 2 and verse 19. Acts chapter 2 and verse 19. This is a prophecy from Joel of what will happen in the last days, verse 17. And it says this. Look at this in verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. So God says he will show signs on the earth, but he will also show signs in heaven. Now look at verse 20. What are some of these signs? The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. So the Bible teaches that God gave us those things in heaven for seasons and for times and for years. And there are markers. And they come around and they do things in the heaven and if you follow that, now I'm not saying you should as a Christian, I believe that the signs are more for the Jews, but if you look at it, and that's what we're going to do today, we're just going to look at a couple examples, you go, wow. <laughs> you can't help but go, wow. There must be a God who did this. Have you ever studied Shemitah cycles? Now some people spell it S-H-E-M-E-T-A-H. I like the I, Shemitah. God is a God who always uses the number seven. I don't have time to go back and read you the law, uh, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible, but over and over and over in the law, there's seven, and seven times seven, and 70. God always uses that number seven. And so you've got these cycles of seven years. Well, someone sent me a video here not too long ago, and I looked at it, and I just went, wow. It was pretty amazing how they said, we look at things differently, don't we? than God does. Oftentimes we look at things different than the way God does. But if God is looking at everything in seven year cycles, which we don't, we usually don't, but this is how God told the Jews to look at things, is seven year cycles. When you look at the seven year cycle, and that's what a Shemitah is, it's a seven year cycle. And a matter of fact, doesn't this go back to Daniel? <laughs> Book of Daniel and the prophecy of 70 weeks, and it was a week of years, so it was Shemitah cycles. When you look at the Shemitah cycles, and you look at these signs in heaven, you can't help 
but come to any other conclusion, then there is a God in heaven who is behind everything, who is helping his people Israel, and who is being there for them and showing them signs in heaven of what he's going to do for them. I just can't help but see it. Let me give you an example. A lot of people say World War II helped the Jews get back their nation. The old saying is this, World War I prepared the, the land for the Jews because of the Balfour Declaration and all that stuff, and then World War II prepared the Jews for the land because of the Holocaust and all that. Many people around the world who were Jews or who claimed to be, uh, you know, there's some false Jews, so it's, I don't know who's the true ones, who's not. All I know is the nation of Israel exists again after almost 2,000 years, just like the Bible prophesied. But a lot of people came back to the nation of Israel who claimed to be Jews. When they came back in 1948, right, the, the, the World War II ended in about 45. World War II ended, and then in 1947, the United Nations partitioned the land, the Holy Land, and said the Jews can have part and the Arabs can have part. And they moved in in 47, and in 48, they declared themselves a nation in 1948 during this Shemitah cycle, the rebirth of Israel. And it just happened to be during this Shemitah cycle, that in heaven there were four blood moons during that time period. And what's amazing to me is they always seem to appear on Jewish feasts. So if you're a Jew and you realize part of the, the feast of Israel depends on the moons and you're supposed to be looking at the moons, if you're a Jew and you're looking, you'd be like, wow, there were just four blood moons. That's interesting. And these are called the blood moons. And it just so happens they correspond in the Shemitah cycle of when they became a nation again. Just coincidence, nothing to see here, right? Except for the fact that you have 52 to 59. That's the first cycle, okay? We're going to look at the Shemitah cycles after Israel became a nation. From 52 to 59 would be the first cycle. 59 to 66 would be the second cycle. 66 to 75 would be the third cycle. And during that time, there just happened to be four blood moons again. And during that time, there just had to be something that took place that was probably one of the most famous things. It was the Six Days War in 19... Was it 67? I think it was 1967. But it was accompanied by signs in heaven for blood moons. And what happened in the Six Days War? Attacked from both sides like a pincher movement. They tried to take over and obliterate and destroy Israel. And God took it back the other way, and they gained more land than they'd ever had in the last 2,000 years. Okay? And it just so happened that happened in heaven, those signs. But that's just coincidence, right? Well, that's what people try to tell you. So you get the fourth cycle, 75 to 80, 80 to 87, fifth cycle, sixth Shemitah cycle, 87 to 94, 94 to 2001, seventh Shemitah cycle, eighth Shemitah cycle, 2001 to 2008. Now we start getting into something interesting. The ninth Shemitah cycle, from when they became a nation, there's four blood moons again. They come on Passover, Sukkoth, Passover, Sukkoth. The first one is 4:15, 14, and the last one is 9:28:15. So in 14 and 15, these blood moons come up again. And you look at that and go, uh, except for the fact that in the next couple of years, something big happens for the nation of Israel. In fact, on September 23rd, 2017, there's this sign in heaven that sounds a lot like Revelation chapter 12. And guess what? That sign has something to do with something that took place later. And eventually it led to Donald J. You-Know-Who, DJT, president, declaring that Jerusalem is the capital of the nation of Israel. Just coincidence, right? Oh, yeah, just coincidence, ha ha. Or maybe there's a God in heaven that cares about his people, the Jews, and he's given them signs in heaven saying, look, you will have a victory here. You will be reborn. You know, the, Israel was born at the beginning out of war. Did you know that? God chose Joshua to go in and start a war and take over, and the nation of Israel was founded through war. Well, after the second great war, they're founded again after a war. And so they're going through this Shemitah cycle, and September 23rd, 2017, there's this sign in heaven, and you look at that sign, and guess what? It corresponds to a president of the United States of America saying, no, no, Jerusalem is your capital, and now Jerusalem is the capital of the nation of Israel. Just coincidence, right? Wink, wink. Uh, no, no, I don't think so. I don't think it's just a coincidence. So that's the 10th Shemitah cycle right here, okay? 
from 2015 to 2022. So that Shemitah cycle is over in 2022, and then is going to start the 11th cycle. That would be a great time for the tribulation, because the number 11 in the Bible is the number for judgment. And what is the tribulation according to the Bible? The seven-year tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a time of God judging Israel. And then at the end, God coming back. So 2022 to 2029. Now, I don't, I don't understand all this because, you know, we're in 2021 now. Maybe the rapture takes place and then comes the tribulation. I don't know. But it's interesting. Someone sent me a video about the Shemitah cycles and I was looking into it and just to see how God does everything by the number seven and just, wow, this would be a perfect time during this Shemitah cycle for the Lord to come back, wouldn't it? It would be great. Well, if that was enough right there, that should be enough to make you want to get saved because Jesus is coming soon and everything in the Bible is true. And right now, God is dealing with the church. But when the church leaves at the rapture, God goes back to dealing with the nation of Israel. And he's showing them through signs in heaven and through the Shemitah cycle, hey, I'm not done with you. I'm not done with you. So that's amazing. That is amazing. Now, there's another thing that I look at in the Bible that makes me think that Jesus is coming soon, and that's the specific feasts. Okay? The specific feasts of Israel. There are some feasts in Israel that are to be kept by the nation every year. There are actually seven feasts. If you get a chance, look up my video on YouTube entitled The Seven Feasts of Israel. And those feasts go like this. First of all, it all comes with a moon. So there's a new moon. And from the new moon, you're supposed to count 14 days for Passover. All right, I believe this is right. Now, I've taught this before because this is what I learned. But please, study it for yourself. I don't want to be wrong, but... This is how I've understood it. So I could be wrong on some of the days here. I don't know. So look this out. But I'm not wrong on the feast. These are the feasts, okay? So the first feast is the feast of Passover. And the feast of Passover is the first feast every year. It comes around springtime. 24 hours after the Passover is, begins a feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's the second feast for Israel. After that comes the Feast of first fruits between two to six days later. But guess what? I say three days because it looked like in the time of Jesus it was three days because Jesus was buried and rose again the third day and all that. Or maybe two days. It could have been two days because it would have been three days after the Passover that he rose again. Then you have 50 days to the Pentecost, okay? And that's the end of the spring feasts. Then you have to wait 135 days and then comes the Feast of Trumpets which would be the fifth of the Feast of Israel, the fifth feast. That is, of course, the Feast of Trumpets. Oh, I raced it here a little bit, sorry. That's the Feast of Trumpets. After the Feast of Trumpets, ten days, is the Feast of Atonement. That would be the sixth of their feasts. After Atonement is uh, five days or so, is the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the seventh feast. 73 days later is the Feast of Hanukkah. Now that feast is not one of the feasts mentioned in the law. In the um, Torah, if you will, the first five books of the Bible are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And those give the law. Well, Hanukkah is not mentioned in the law. These other seven are. There's actually another feast called the Feast of Purim. And I don't have time to get into Purim, the Feast of Purim. Hag Purim, Hag Purim. I always think of that when I because we went to a Jewish place one time on their Feast of Purim and listened to their beautiful music and things like that. So there's Purim and there's Hanukkah. Those are two other feasts that they made kind of as their custom and that it's in the Bible, but it wasn't in the original seven in the first five books of the Bible. So there's these other two feasts also. And I just wanted to throw that out there. But the seven main feasts under the law of Israel are Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, Trumpets, Atonement, and tabernacles. Those are the seven main ones. So you don't have to know about Hanukkah, although that is an interesting one. So, in the Bible, the Apostle Paul got some revelation from Jesus Christ. And one of the things that God revealed to Paul was this, because Paul writes about this a lot in his uh, epistles, is the fact that Jesus is 
represented by these feasts. So these feasts all represent something that takes place in the life of Jesus Christ. For example, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, the Bible teaches, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The end of the verse. Even For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And what is he? He's, he's the unleavened bread. Now also, Christ is also first fruits. All right, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20, look what it says here. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So Jesus Christ is Passover. He was the Passover lamb, unleavened bread, and first fruits. I forgot to give you John chapter 6 and verse 48 where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So Jesus claims to be these feasts. So when they're celebrating these feasts, all of Israel celebrated these for thousands of years, and then Jesus shows up and does something on these feasts to say, hey, this was me giving you foreknowledge, saying, I am the one that wrote the law, and I am he whom you're looking for, and all these feasts were types of me to make you think about me. Well, these feasts are over. Jesus Christ went up on the Feast of Pentecost. He went up. So those were what we call the spring feasts. And so the feasts are types of Christ, and Christ does something in his ministry that is done on these feast days that make us think of him. So Jesus went back up to heaven. Now, he's coming back. When is he coming back? I don't know. But if he seems to be doing all these really important things in his ministry on the feast days, a lot of people think that then in that case, the future feast, the fall feast, these prophetic feasts have to be prophetic on the life of Jesus. So the next one is trumpets. So the next feast to be fulfilled is the Feast of Trumpets. And if that lines up with Jesus, then wouldn't that be something that would be on the next part for Jesus' ministry? Well, what's the next thing that Jesus is supposed to do in the Bible? He's supposed to come for his bride, the church, and get married and take her up. And that would be called the rapture. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and look at what it says. Happens at the rapture. This is a passage about the rapture, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and look at what it says. Remember, Feast of Trumpets would be the next one to be fulfilled. And it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed at the rapture. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump... <laughs> For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? So the rapture is said to take place at the last trump, and a trumpet is blown. Now, the Jewish feast, supposedly, they blow a trumpet a hundred times. And they say that the last trump is the final trump. The last trump. Now, I've heard that. So a lot of Christians are saying, we think that when it blows that final trumpet sound, the final trump, that's when the rapture has to be. I don't know. I've heard other people say, well, these two feasts are connected, and that the last trump is really here at atonement. Well, if the rapture comes at atonement, then there we'd be at one with our Lord and Savior, wouldn't we? We'd be up there with them. I don't see a rapture on tabernacles because something has to line up with Jesus Christ coming back at Armageddon. And what does he come back for? He comes back to tabernacle on earth with his people, the Jews, and rule for a thousand years. So I think Armageddon is more for tabernacles. So it'd have to be trumpets or atonement that the rapture would come if we continue what we've already seen, Jesus Christ completing the different feasts. So it would stand to reason that the rapture would probably be on one of the feasts of Israel. To take out the church so that God could then come back to dealing with Israel, who rejected him as their Messiah. You see, he died on the cross to make an atonement for their sin, but they rejected that. So for 2,000 years they rejected the blood atonement of Christ. The Jews to this day still think that they need to go and offer an animal for forgiveness of sins. They don't see that that blood God no longer accepts. It's the blood of his son on the cross. So the atonement, wouldn't that be when the Jews 
realize, oh, he's the true atonement. Now we receive him. And that would take place probably in the middle of the tribulation. Because the Jews then flee. And for 1,260 days, they are kept by God. And so I just wanted to throw this all up here. Amen. Jesus must be coming soon. There's so many things pointing to that. First of all, the scriptures. No man knoweth the day or hour, people say. But then you read the rest of the Bible and it says, if you're not looking, then you won't know the day or you won't know the hour. So the opposite is, if you are looking, then you would know, wouldn't you? And ever so much the more as we see the day appearing. I mean, we're getting closer and closer. And what's making us think we're close to the rapture? The seasons. We look at the season. Paul says, I don't need to write unto you concerning the seasons. You yourselves know perfectly. It's like, wow. So we who are Christians, we can know. They even knew when Elijah was going to be raptured in the Old Testament. Said, so don't you know today he's going? Yeah, I know. What, how, how can they have this knowledge of knowing? Well, to the Jews, God gave some signs. And these signs are all in the heavens. Pointing to them, hey, get ready, I'm coming back to dealing with you. And you look at their Shemitah cycles, wow, this looks like the last cycle before what would be a perfect time for the tribulation. Well, what happens before the tribulation? The rapture. But if it's got to happen on one of these feasts, then trumpets 2021. So that then, on 2022, the tribulation should come. Now, I didn't even get a chance to get into these um, eclipses, right? We read over there in Acts chapter 2, where he's quoting Joel chapter 2. And he says, the moon shall turn to blood. Well, blood red moons. And then the, the sun will turn to blackness or to darkness. Well, that sounds like an eclipse. And here in the United States of America, we had an eclipse on August 21st, 2017. And there'll be another eclipse in 2024. And eclipses are pretty ominous. Pretty ominous. A lot of people say that when an eclipse happens over a certain place, it's God giving a sign or a signal that something's going to happen. A lot of people say God is done with America, and that's God telling America, hey, man, you better watch out. Because, uh, yeah, because I'm done with you. Because you've turned against me. And we see a lot more people in America turning against God, and that's sad, that's sad. Well, I don't want to turn against God. I want to come to God. And I can't wait for God to come to me, because he's promised in the Bible the rapture. And then comes Armageddon. And Armageddon is when he comes back at the end of this tribulation period and takes over and rules for a thousand years. So there it is. It's not a long message today, but it's long enough, and I think I presented enough to show you how could anyone deny that we're not in the end of the church age? Like I said last week, last week's sermon was the end of the church age, the great reset. If you get a chance, please watch that. That's a good sermon as well. Well, everything is pointing to the season of this is the season of the rapture because now is coming the time of the tribulation, of the judgment of God, that final judgment of God in the book of Daniel in which he prophesies the 70 weeks. Well, that last week hasn't taken place yet. And boy, this would be a perfect time in the Shemitah for it to take place. And then, of course, the feasts. They've got to be the feasts. Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again. He sprung forth, <laughs> springing up. He sprung up from the grave, having accomplished or having completed in the prophetic type these feasts. Well, now he's coming back. He's going to come down from heaven and take up us at the rapture. Then he's going to stay up there while down here on the earth is the seven-year tribulation. Then he's going to come back and set up his kingdom for a thousand years. So when I look at all these things, I go, man, Jesus must be coming soon. I don't see how it can be another year or two. I mean, it just everything seems to be falling in place. And the sooner Jesus comes at the rapture, the better. So let me ask you this. Are you saved? The Bible says you must be born again. The Bible says salvation is through faith. Faith in what? Romans 3.25, through faith in his blood. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And you were saved by believing in that. Because Jesus died for your sins to make an atonement for your sins. Will you trust him today? If you trust him, you'll go at the rapture. And that rapture, it must be coming soon. So are you saved? Are you going at the rapture? I hope so. We might have another sermon next week. We may not. The rapture just might come first. 
But if not, well, we'll see you every week with a new sermon in English and in Spanish. And hope you come, hope you watch, hope you learn the Bible with me. God bless you.